really does get hot. Hi everyone, welcome to the College of the Environment's virtual visit day event. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded for future use. My name is Barbara Owens. I'm the undergraduate student services specialist in the Dean's office in the College of the Environment. That's a big long title, but I do undergrad stuff. I use she and her pronouns. I hope you enjoyed the video you just watched. It provided a sneak peek into our undergrad programs. And we are excited to welcome you all today to the second of five webinars that we're doing this summer, exploring our majors in more depth. Today's session is focused on our marine science programs. You'll hear from our Dean. You'll watch many lessons from two of our faculty, and then you will have time to ask the faculty members questions live. This will be followed by additional Q&A time after that with current students and also with academic advisors. So we should be wrapping up the whole thing today by about 3.30 p.m. So we're gonna go ahead and show you our intro and the mini lessons. Hello, I'm Lisa Gromlich. I'm Dean of the College of the Environment at the University of Washington. Welcome to the virtual visit days. So, I'm a proud Husky, I'm an alumni. I grew up in the Midwest and went to undergraduate colleges in the Midwest, but I came to UW for graduate school. And there were lots of choices out there, but UW stood out way back when as a place where, as a student, I quickly learned that I came first and that I had the ability to define my passion and to pursue it with the best faculty on the planet. I'm actually not kidding about the faculty part. We are the largest college of its kind in the nation and our faculty are incredible. And I'll tell you a secret about them. They're actually also amazingly kind and they love to interact with undergraduates. And you're gonna get a chance to meet a couple of them very soon. So I'm the Dean, I'm in charge of all the learning, the research and the public education. And I do this because I am passionate about the science both for the joy simply of discovering more and more about how the planet works, but also by bringing our best scientific tools to address our most challenging problems. If it's climate change or conservation or how do we become safe from hazards like earthquakes or tsunamis or how will we feed the world's growing population? That is the kind of work we do here. So thank you for spending time with us. I know your prospective students, your coming out of high school, maybe a gap year, you're coming from another college. We also have your families with us. Thank you so much for your interest in our college. These virtual visit days are meant to give you a taste of the College of the Environment. You'll get a chance to meet faculty, you'll get a chance to virtually visit labs and classrooms on campus and connect with the staff and current students who will answer your questions. Beyond this one hour event, we hope you'll continue to connect with us to learn more. And in closing, I wanna tell you a little bit about our, how we do the work at the college. What is our mission and teaching philosophy? We believe in immersive learning. We believe people learn best by doing things. So we, in all of our classes, we seek to have you try out skills. We seek to connect you with the kind of 
skills that will give you a leg up in the real world of professional work in these fields. We're hands-on, we're solutions-based, and we have lots and lots of choices because, did I mention, we're the largest college of its kind in the country. Um, but I want to say a bit about size. Um, when you come to UW, you are at a very large and prestigious university. It's very large. But when you're in the College of the Environment, you're with a couple thousand students. If you think about it, that's about the size of a small college, private college. And so it's the kind of place where faculty and staff will know you by name. We know that when you are connected personally to your college, it makes a difference in your happiness. It makes a difference in your productivity. And it absolutely makes a difference in your future success. So once again, thank you for joining us. Enjoy the virtual tour. And I hope you stay in touch. Bye bye. Hi, everyone. My name is Jose Guzman. Uh, my preferred pronouns are he and him. And I am a faculty member in the Aquatic and Fishery Sciences and the Marine Biology programs, both in the College of the Environment. I normally teach some of the introductory courses in the marine biology major, including uh, introduction to marine biology, aquatic physiology, and evolutionary biology, working primarily with undergrads. Uh, when I'm not teaching, you can probably find me either in my office trying to come up with new challenges for my students or in the lab doing research on fish reproductive biology. In this video, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is osmoregulation, uh, which is actually the research that brought me to work in a lab for the first time when I was an undergrad, a couple of years probably older than, than most of you. Uh, we can define osmoregulation using a non-fancy definition as the capacity of some organisms to maintain optimal levels of ions like sodium, potassium, chloride, and water inside of them independently of the environment where they are at. So if you check all these organisms in this slide, some of them live in fresh water, like the freshwater clam or the goldfish, or in salt water, like the octopus or Nemo, the clownfish, or actually they can move between fresh water and seawater like the eel or the salmon. Some of them can maintain constant level of ions, sodium, potassium, chloride, sulfate, and water, which is different to the concentration of the environment where they're at. And let me tell you why this is actually pretty cool. Imagine that we have two tanks here, one with seawater in the left, uh, water from the ocean, and the other one with uh, fresh water in the right, which water from a river. Uh, if I ask you which one is saltier, you'll say, the, obviously, the water from the ocean, right? Because it has a lot of salt. It's not like fresh water has no salt at all, but it has much less salt than the water from the ocean. And now if I ask you which one has more ions, we can say, well, because salts are made of ions, we can say that the concentration of ions, like the sodium, potassium, chloride, is much higher in the ocean, which is saltier, than in the river. Okay, now let's keep these two tanks, but let's place an organism. Uh, for the purpose of this lecture, and you can laugh if you want, I want you to think of organisms like bags, like a grocery store plastic bag but with little holes like pores. And through these pores, water and ions can move in and out freely. And they move in and out until the concentration uh, of, of the ions that is inside the organism and what is outside the, of the organism reach an equilibrium, meaning that it's the same inside and outside. Well, that's what happened in some marine organisms. If you check the concentration of ions inside and outside, it's very, very, very similar. And the same exact thing happens with some freshwater species. The concentration of ions, sodium, potassium, chloride is the same 
inside and outside. Remember that these guys have holes by which ions can move in and out freely. If I ask you which one of these two organisms have a higher concentration of ions, you'll say, well, of course, the guy that lives in seawater. And that is because, one, there's more salt in the ocean than in the river. And we said that the concentration inside and outside the organism is the same. Therefore, the blue guy has higher concentration of ions inside than the green guy. And that's what we call osmoconformers. Osmoconformers are those organisms that cannot really control the concentration of ions inside. And therefore, if the salinity of the environment changes, increases or decreases, the concentration of ions inside of them will increase or decrease accordingly. But that's not always true in all of aquatic species. Some species actually can maintain internal concentrations of ions that are different to those of the environment where they live. So we normally observe that if they are in seawater, which is salty, they keep an internal concentration of ions lower than the environment. If they're in fresh water, which is not salty, they tend to keep an internal concentration of ions higher than the environment. We call these guys osmoregulators. But now the cool part is how they do that. I mean, these guys still have holes or pores by which ions and water move in and out. How can they keep concentrations of ions inside that are different to what's going on outside? Well, in seawater, uh, these guys tend to drink a lot of water to dilute the concentration of ions inside. But because the water is salty, they produce a very, very concentrated urine. So they keep the water inside and get rid of the ions. So they pee just a little bit, but it's super, super concentrated. Uh, also, they have special mechanisms in their gills, if they have gills, or some of them in their kidney or intestines to pump ions out. In freshwater, it's just the other way around. These guys do not drink water because remember, there's not a lot of ions in the water. What they do is to pee a lot. They produce large volumes of pee, but a very, very diluted urine to get rid of water by keeping ions inside. They also have mechanisms in their gills or other organs to uptake ions. And they are very, very efficient at retaining ions from food. So pretty much by regulating how much water they drink, how much they pee and pumping ions in and out through their gills and other organs, they can keep different concentrations of ions as compared to the environment where they live. Hi, we're in the lab at the School of Aquatic and Fish Bay Sciences now, and it's time for us to put into practice this idea of osmoregulation. So for that, we have a, a bunch of uh, little crabs here. These are um, shore crabs or um, green shore crabs. I don't know if you can see them, these little guys here. So they are very, very common in the US West Coast. And actually, they are very common in West Europe and all around the world. So if you are in a rocky beach and you flip a rock, probably you'll find a bunch of, of these guys. So if you were here with me in the lab, I will ask you, okay, I want you to design and run an experiment to figure out whether these little guys here are osmoregulators or osmoconformers. But because you're not here right now, so I'm going to help you a little bit with the, with the experiment. So I set up three different tents here. One, as you can see, 15 um, uh, part per thousands, which is a low salinity water. We have 35 parts per thousand, which is the average salinity of the seawater. And then we have 55 parts per thousand, which is a high salinity water. So this is, the, as I said, the average salinity of the, of the ocean. This is the equivalent of the salinity of the water of a river when it meets the ocean. It's a slightly salty, but not super salty. 
at least 55 parts per thousand will be the equivalent to the salinity in a tide pool. You know, when there's low tide and some water remains in the intertidal, and in summer, water evaporates and salinity increases. So there are salinities that, that these crabs may find in their, in their lab. So what we're going to do is take these crabs, we're going to put them in three different salinities, and uh, figure out if they are osmoregulators or osmoconformers. We cannot measure or determine uh, the amount of water that they drink, or the amount of pee that they produce. So we're going to follow a different approach to these. We have this little machine here, which is a osmometer, and it's going to give you uh, units of osmolarity. Osmolarity is pretty much uh, the amount of stuff that these little guys have inside. Uh, so if you have high osmolarity, it will mean that they have a lot of stuff, a lot of ions, and if they have low osmolarity, uh, it means they will have low amount of ions. So for that, what we're going to do is just take a little bit of their uh, hemolymph, which is equivalent to their blood. These little crabs do not have blood. Most of the invertebrates don't have blood. And they have an upper circulatory system with hemolymph that carries uh, nutrients and oxygen and carbon dioxide. So what I'm going to do now is Take some of these crabs and if they let me grab them and I'm going to put three crabs in each cell in it. One hour later. Uh, so time's up. Um, it's been an hour and a half since we started the experiment, and now we're gonna take Hamelin from these little guys. So we're gonna be using that strength. And let me grab one of these guys here. back in this little um, beaker there so we don't repeat sampling and this little drop here I don't know if you can see it very well uh, it will be enough to measure their osmolarity so we have the tubes here there you go 10 microliters Okay, I just finished uh, measuring all the uh, smolarity samples and uh, we have two different data sets. We have osmolarity from the hemolymph of the crabs, the concentration of ions inside the crabs, and we also have the osmolarity of the water, uh, which is going to give you an idea of the concentration of ions that was in the water. And these are these two graphs here. This is the osmolarity in crabs you can see uh, the different osmolarities at 15, 35, and 55 part per thousand. And you have um, here the osmolarity of the water at 15, 35, and 55 parts per thousand. And as you can see, as expected, the osmolarity of the water increases as you increase salinity. Um, However, the concentration or the osmolarity of the crabs, the hemolymph, what's going on inside of them, does not change uh, through salinity. So, my question now is, are these guys osmoregulators or osmoconformers? Let me know. Welcome to the UW College of the Environment's virtual visit to the marine sciences. I am Dr. Mikhail Neuer. 
My preferred pronouns are she and hers. I am a senior lecturer in the School of Oceanography. By training, I'm a biological oceanographer. My graduate research focuses on speciation events in a tiny marine crustacean called a copepod. In my current position, I'm responsible for teaching introductory oceanography courses, training our departmental graduate teaching assistants, and leading workshops to revise and improve ocean science curriculum. I'd like to give you a taste of what Ocean 101 or Oceanography of the Pacific Northwest is like. The course is scheduled as three weekly interactive lectures of 50 minutes with an enrollment of approximately 100 students and a weekly two hour lab section in smaller groups of 25 students. If this was a live class, I'd ask you lots of questions by polling. I'd have you turn to your neighbor discuss and I would expect that you ask me lots of questions. Instead, you have to just listen to me talk. I'll begin with a mini lecture on ocean acidification, which is an important topic that gets a lot of headline news. And then I'll lead you through a short demonstration that I think is the best way to visualize ocean acidification and change in pH. In the classroom, I use this as an invitation to the weekly lab activity. I'll end with implications for the health of Pacific Northwest waters and human health. Some of the Pacific Northwest's most iconic food species are threatened directly or indirectly by ocean acidification. These include oysters, salmon, and crab. The question I want you to ask is why? Why are our local waters so susceptible to ocean acidification? To find out, we first have to understand what ocean acidification is. So, what is it? Fundamental changes in seawater chemistry are occurring throughout the world's oceans. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the release of carbon dioxide from human activities, including industrial emissions and agricultural activities, has increased the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The oceans absorb about a quarter of this carbon dioxide that we release every year. When Carbon dioxide is dissolved in water. It goes through a series of chemical reactions as shown on this image. Dissolved carbon dioxide reacts with water to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a weak acid. It disassociates or falls apart quickly into three species, bicarbonate, carbonate, and hydrogen ions. The relative concentration of these three ions is pH dependent. But it's the hydrogen ions I want you to think about. It is those that are responsible, or sorry, it is these that are responsible for reducing the pH. Since seawater is slightly basic, ocean acidification involves a shift towards pH neutral conditions rather than a transition to acidic conditions like the names suggest. Did you get all that? I know, it's a lot. On the next slide, we'll define what these terms mean, including what pH is. Acidity is the concentration of hydrogen ions in an aqueous solution. The concentration of hydrogen can vary across many orders of magnitude, and therefore we express or show it on a logarithmic scale. pH is defined as the negative log of the concentration of hydrogen ions. A change in one pH unit on the scale corresponds to a huge tenfold change in hydrogen ion concentration. This is shown on the figure on this slide. This very simple blowing bubbles demo shows you how. I have just a few basic materials for this demo. A beaker filled about a quarter full with tap water, but I'm going to ask you, like I would my students, how would this be different if it were salt water? If I was teaching students in a lab, I would give students the materials to do this on their own after the basic experiment. We also do this with different types of solutions. To visualize the pH of the water or the solution, I have a pH indicator die. The color that the solution turns can indicate the pH using this color chart. I also have a straw. 
I apologize that it's plastic, but I promise to use it again and again and again. By adding about 10 drops of this indicator dye to the water, we can visualize the approximate pH of the water. You can see that it's a nice blue-green color, which indicates a pH between 7 to 8 on this chart. Now I'm going to blow bubbles by exhaling through this straw. The main gas that I am exhaling is CO2. What do you think is going to happen to the color? Will it change and what does that indicate? I want to remind you that pH is a measure of the concentration of hydrogen ions. Why does exhaling CO2 or how could it change the concentration of hydrogen ions. Let's see what happens. So there's our big wow. I hope you can see the color change. It went from that blue-green color indicating a pH between 7 and 8 to a yellow color indicating a pH of 6. Our pH decreased. Why? Well, remember that pH is the negative log of the concentration of hydrogen ions. As we blew into our water, the CO2 reacted with the water, producing carbonic acid. Carbonic acid immediately disassociated into three ions, hydrogen ions, carbonate, and bicarbonate. The color change indicates an increase in the hydrogen ions, which decreased the pH and indicates that our water is more acidic. This is what is happening in the global ocean. I want to leave you with one question. How long do you think it will take this water to go back to being that blue-green color? I'm going to leave you with that. Keep asking questions and making observations. Thank you. Now that you understand how increasing carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere result in a pH change in the ocean, we can discuss how the change in seawater chemistry impacts the health of marine organisms and ultimately our own health. Absorption of carbon dioxide by seawater decreases concentration of carbonate ions. Carbonate ions are used by marine organisms known as calcifiers that precipitate calcium carbonate skeletons or hard parts like shells. As shown in this figure, carbon dioxide reacts with carbonate ions in seawater. Adding carbon dioxide to the ocean lowers carbonate concentrations and makes it more difficult for organisms that build their shells, those calcifiers, like some types of plankton and corals to build their hard parts. Calcifying organisms include many types of shellfish, like oysters and gooey ducks, corals, and both phyto and zooplankton. Examples are the foraminifera, pteropods, and coccolithophores. These plankton are the base of the marine food web. Shellfish, such as oysters, clams, crabs, and scallops, provide food for marine life and for people too. The decreases in seawater carbonate concentration impact their survival, their growth, physiology, and in turn, food webs and the economies that depend on them. Both deep sea and shallow reef building corals have calcium carbonate skeletons. Coral reef declines will have alarming consequences for approximately 50 million people who depend on them for food, coastal protection, building materials, and income from tourism. This includes 30 million who are virtually totally dependent on coral reefs for their livelihoods or for the land they live on. Increased levels of carbon dioxide in our ocean can have a wide variety of impacts on fish, including altering their food source, changing their behaviors. They're even implicated in deformed ear bones and in young fish's growth. Commercial fisheries depend on species sensitive to ocean acidification. In fact, about 50% of U.S. fisheries revenue comes from shellfish and crustaceans. 
These fisheries are valued between four and five billion dollars per year. Research being done here in Seattle at the University of Washington and at NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratories are showing that ocean acidification is directly impacting our iconic Pacific salmon through interference with their sensory receptors and indirectly through changes in the food web. The Pacific salmon's diet is made up of about 60% pteropods. This is a marine zooplankton that is a calcifier changes in seawater pH are expected to decrease pteropod populations and in turn salmon populations by about 20% in the next five to 10 years. Processes that are affecting ocean acidification in coastal waters of the west coast of North America are shown on this slide. You can see that west coast ocean circulation is dynamic. It is also vulnerable to ocean acidification due to a combination of human and natural processes. Water in the North Pacific is naturally rich in carbon dioxide because the deep water has been out of contact with the atmosphere for a very long time as a result of global ocean circulation patterns. While water masses travel along the oceanic conveyor belt, they accumulate carbon dioxide through natural respiration processes that break down the sinking organic matter. Along the U.S. West Coast, winds blow from north to south during spring and summer months, pushing surface water offshore. Deeper water, that is high in CO2, is upwelled or comes up from the deep to replace that water that is blown offshore. These waters are very high in CO2, have a low pH, and low carbonate saturation states, and have deleterious consequences for the marine organisms that live in the surface ocean. Many oceanographers and environmental scientists consider ocean acidification to be the single greatest threat to the future of ocean ecosystems. It is a global problem with local consequences. What does the future hold? Well, that's really up to us. Since increasing carbon dioxide concentration in the ocean are directly correlated with increasing carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. I know it's depressing, but I want you to take a look at predicted pH change by the year 2100 if we continue on a business as usual carbon emissions scenario. Like I said, it's up to us. And like so many of the topics we explore in courses in the College of the Environment, I want you to know that you can be part of the solution through education, research and policy. The UW School of Oceanography is ranked number one globally. Undergraduates in our program and others in the College of the Environment are involved in cutting edge research and making contributions to understand the science of ocean acidification and so many other topics that are related to climate change and human health. Thank you for joining me. I hope you have questions when we meet in the virtual world. Thank you again. All right. So it's summertime. You guys might be taking a break from school, but we do have a couple questions for you based on um, the lessons that Jose and Mikel just provided for you. So go ahead and um, take that poll that popped up there. So I hope you enjoyed seeing some of our teaching and research spaces on campus. And now Mikkel and Jose are available to answer any questions you might have. So please use the Q&A option to type in your question. I see a couple questions in there already, which is great. Please don't share any personal student information as part of your question because everyone will see all of those questions. You can feel free to address your question to a specific person if you like. This part of the Q&A will end at about 3 p.m. and then we will start the student and advisor panel for further Q&A. So go ahead and start typing in your questions now. And Jose, actually I think we'll 
start with you. We have a couple questions that came up while you were doing your presentation about what kind of crabs and I think there was one that you marked you were going to answer live there as well. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> hi, everyone. So what kind of crabs were there? Uh, those were uh, short crabs or green short crabs. They are super, super common um, in the uh, West Coast here in the U.S. And these are these tiny, tiny crabs. If you are um, in the beach and it's low tide and you flip a rock, you may find 50 or 60 of those little guys. Um, so they are very common um, in the intertidal here. And there's another question about how they uptake ions. Um, primarily, they uptake ions directly through gills. Uh, so many fish, fishes have these chloride cells, which is a specific type of cell. And they have a bunch of co-transporter and mechanisms by which they uh, uptake or get rid of ions. And from there, from there those ions can go directly to their, to their blood. Um, gills is the main osmoregulatory uh, organ, but as I said, uh, some species um, is kidneys and, and the um, digestive tract. Okay, a... and then um, Jose, I'll share the results here of our poll. Can you see that? Okay. okay. So how'd we do? <laughs> you did okay. They are some relators. Yeah, so most of you got it right. So when you maintain, uh, you, you saw in the, in the video the osmolarity of the seawater increased as we increase salinity, which is expected. You have more ions as you increase salinity, so the osmolarity increases. But what we saw with the crabs was like, a, it doesn't matter the salinity where they were placed at, the osmolarity was pretty constant. It was the same at 15, uh, 15 parts per thousand, 35 and I think it was 50 or, or 55. So they were very similar. So meaning that they can control their osmolarity. When they are in fresh water, in low salinity, they will be uptaking ions from the water. They were peeing a lot. They were not drinking a lot of water. Uh, and if you move into high salinity water, they will be just getting rid of those ions actively and very likely um, peeing a little bit, but uh, very concentrated urine. The cool thing about this uh, is that this is a general trend. What we see generally in marine species or uh, aquatic species, but as soon as you scratch a little deeper in one of these organisms, you can see that things are, are, are different one to another and gives you a lot of room to, to do research and see what, what are the species specific mechanisms uh, that allowed specific organisms to, to thrive in different environments. And that's so cool. All right. And Mikkel, how about your question on the poll here? How did we do answering that one? A bit this, of a is, <laughs> this is a great example of a really good polling question because we could spend a lot of time as a class talking about why you answered the way you did. So the honest answer is, I don't know. I have never waited long enough. I have never been patient enough to leave that beaker sitting out. But um, the only process that is at play with that beaker of water is diffusion. And diffusion is a very slow process. So unless we were to mix it, or unless we were to add something, or unless a biological organism used some of that carbon dioxide in solution, it would stay as it is. So the take home message is that um, once we put that CO2 in the water, it's there unless there's other physical or biological processes at play. And there are scientists who are looking at ways to remove CO2 from both the atmosphere and from seawater, but un unfortunately, and fortunately, the ocean is absorbing a lot of excess carbon dioxide. So that was a, that was a great question to ask. I have a couple others. Do you want me to answer yeah. those too? 
Absolutely, go for it, thanks. So the first question is who lives on coral reefs? Coral reefs account for 0.2% of the surface area in the oceans. They're just in shallow water, but about 25% of marine species use them in some way. So that's as habitat. So who lives on them? I can't even name how many species of invertebrates, of vertebrates, lots of different kinds of fish, a lot that are very commercially important and a lot that are extinct. They're also used as feeding grounds, breeding grounds, and areas where organisms go to escape predation. So they're very, very important systems in our ocean. And unfortunately, they're getting kind of a quadruple whammy. So not only is it ocean acidification that's a threat, but also global warming temperatures, um, as the oceans warm, those the corals are actually an animal, and um, they have a symbiotic relationship with an alga. And as temperatures warm, the animal freaks out and basically spits out that alga, known as coral, coral bleaching, and disease because of warming conditions and increased sedimentation rates from land are all really threatening corals. So they are being threatened. And again, it's one of those really depressing statistics, but by the year 2100, we expect that most of our natural coral reef systems will disappear. But there's good news. People and scientists are investigating ways to revive corals and are growing corals in labs to transplant in, in the ecosystem. And again, if you walk by our oceanography building and peer in the windows, you can see some, of, some corals that are being grown and active research that is being done on ocean acidification. Which leads me to my next question about how you get involved in research. It is super easy. So each department does it differently, but in the, call, but in the School of Oceanography, our first year students are paired with a faculty mentor. Sometimes that pairing works really well, and other times that faculty member works with the student to find out what their interests are and helps them find their place in a research lab in campus. Sometimes that's in the School of Oceanography and that sometimes it's within the College of the Environment or even in another college in the university. But all you need to do to get involved in research is to contact the faculty, be persistent, and show them that this is what you want to do. Awesome, thanks. And you can go ahead and mark those as answered. And then Jose, did you get a chance to answer live the question for you about how they uptake their ions? I did not, I did not okay. answer live. Uh, and, okay. But I answered right, right now, I did. The mechanisms by which they uptake okay. ions. Awesome. And then, Let's see. So there's other questions here about, there's one about field work and we have another one about research opportunities. So I think we answered that. Um, as far as when you can apply, you can apply your first quarter here. We have freshmen who start doing that right away. Um, so talk to us about Friday Harbor Labs. Someone want to answer that? Um, that is awesome. <laughs> Get to see there. Uh, so Friday Harbor Labs, these are labs that the University of Washington has in Friday Harbor, which was in the San Juan Island, is this beautiful island, um, and we get to have a set of labs there. So you can go there, there's a bunch of um, housing and, and labs and, and uh, facilities that you can go there to um, to do research or, or to uh, do either, either an independent research or a guided research. So you can access or you can go to those facilities either if you're taking a class in main campus and you go there for a field trip. I do that with my uh, marine bio students, uh, the freshmen. We go there once or twice in the quarter and do some um, trolling and um, fish dissection and a couple of experiments. And then there are courses that are being there. So you can go there to these Friday Harbor facilities uh, over for an entire quarter for the three months, or you can do a three week intensive course. Um, and actually I'm teaching that class now in early September. That class is for um, senior students that are about to graduate. And, and we asked them to do their own independent research project. And we put up there 
uh, disposition all the thing and all the facilities and all the resources that we have at Friday Harbor uh, to answer their own research questions. So it's a pretty cool, it's like the grand finale for the, for the marine biology uh, major. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Awesome. All right. And then, Mikhail, you've been answering a couple where that any that you wanted to talk about live on there. Lisa, multiple questions about how difficult it is to get into marine biology or oceanography. And I just want to stress that these are open majors. So all you have to do is declare. And all of these schools or units within the College of Environment are relatively small. So for example, in oceanography, we have about 100 undergraduate students. And so we really, and we have about 60 faculty. So we have this amazing ratio. The largest class we teach at the 400 level is about 25 to 30 students. So we have all these re resources of the large research institution. But when you declare your major in one of the units in the College of the Environment, it really gets specialized and you get a lot of attention. So it's really these small units in this really big institution. Awesome. All right. So any other questions for Jose and Mikkel? Is there anyone working on research having to do with kelp forests and their effect on ocean acidification? So I assume you mean when you're saying ocean acidification, I assume that you know a bit about ocean acidification and that photosynthetic organisms use CO2 that's in seawater. And so they can reduce CO2 concentrations and increased pH of water. These are very productive systems, but they're really limited to kind of these small areas of the ocean, this certain depth range. So um, there's a lots of research on kelp forests and specifically looking at sea urchins, which could be impacted by ocean acidification or are impacted by ocean acidification. But I'm not aware of any projects that are looking at that connection between ocean acidification and kelp forests. But as Jose was just saying, our seniors do their own independent research projects, whether it's just offshore being accessed from a large or small ship, whether you're at Friday Harbor. And this is a question that you could ask. You could even do it in a lab with kelp samples to see what, how, how kelp reduce acidity. All right, and then talk to us about, in light of COVID-19, what's happening with field work and research? Well, um, we are still doing field work and we're still doing research. Um, in main campus in Seattle, it's a little more limited, but it's still going on. But if we go to Friday Harbor, it's fully rock and rolling all the time they did not stop. So they are strict about um, um, policies to go in and out. You have to get tested a few times. Uh, you have to work in pods. Um, you have to be under a controlled environment, but you have full access to their facilities and the experiments keep moving on. And, and as I said, they're still doing research. Uh, even more, I'm teaching a class there in two weeks. And it's going to be a three week class. Uh, and then in the fall, we're going to have a version of the marine biology class that I teach. The lectures will be online, but a section of the labs are going to be, it's going to be there in Friday Harbor. So students are going to be able to do the research, either labs, either no, both labs and field trips from Friday Harbor. So even when research in main campus has been a little bit affected by COVID, in Friday Harbor, which is our state-of-the-art res uh, research marine station, uh, still going on. Fully functional and super fun. From a teaching perspective, we're committed to getting our senior students the experiences that they need to th 
to thrive and succeed in the world. And so this is one of the biggest questions we're trying to answer is how are our students going to be able to go on these cruises um, that they have scheduled? Oceanographic cruises are happening. As Jose said, they require quarantining and lots of sampling before you are allowed on the ship. But the field work, the research is not stopping. Definitely is slower. And we have lots of safety protocols because that is the most important thing is to keep everyone safe. But it is not stopping. And we are committed to giving our students these experiences. Great, thank you for that. All right, anything else for Jose and Mikal? We, we can always open this up and bring in our student um, panelists and our advisors. So last call for Mikel and Jose. All right, well, thanks you guys so much for making this a really cool session. Um, thanks for your energy and thoughtful questions for Mikel and Jose. We're gonna move on now. We're gonna be joined by two of our academic advisors and you'll get a chance to ask them questions and you're gonna meet some of our students. And with the students, you can ask them anything about how they chose their major, how they chose UW, life on campus, anything. So you'll keep using that Q&A option down there. So thanks, Mikkel and Jose. All right, and as we welcome our new faces here, give us a minute, we got a couple more coming. All right, so I'll have the students introduce themselves First, so Ina, do you want to go ahead? Hello, um, I'm Ina. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm a junior studying marine biology, and one of my college highlights is taking a marine biology first year interest group. Um, by taking classes together, getting to explore Friday Harbor Labs together, I spent a lot of time getting to know people who have similar interests as I do, and therefore made a lot of close friends. Hi, I'm Jordan. I'm a junior, and I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I'm double majoring in oceanography and dance, and one highlight of my college experience has been designing building and deploying my own temperature sensor off the UW dock. All right, I think that's me next. Uh, so hi, my name is Reagan. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I just graduated with a degree in aquatic and fishery sciences, minors in marine biology and quantitative science, which is just a lot of words that mean I really like fish and I'm almost willing to do math. Um, so I think I would say the highlight of my experience was definitely a study abroad to American Samoa, like you really can't pass that one up. Um, and that led to a lot of awesome work with the uh, fish collection, um, lots of dead fish in jars. It's way cooler than it sounds. <laughs> awesome. And then we also have two of our academic advisors joining us here. So the marine sciences are made up of three majors on campus. Um, our oceanography advisor wasn't able to be with us, but Joe, I'll have you go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi everybody, my name is Joe Kobayashi. I'm the academic advisor for the marine biology major and minor. I use he, him, his pronouns and um, my role really, I'm here to help you with um, exploring the academic programs, uh, help you once you're there, uh, both with your academic planning, so what you need to do, what order you need to do it, connecting to resources, and then hopefully keeping in touch when you're a cool alumni like Reagan. All right, and Sam, hi. Nice backdrop, Sam. Thank you. I actually, I actually took that photo. Um, my name is Samantha Shearer. I use uh, she, her pronouns, um, but I go by Sam typically. Um, I'm the uh, academic advisor in aquatic and fishery sciences and um, among a number of other things I do, uh, I work with undergrad students um, in the major and also finding opportunities to just kind of expand on time at UW and make it the richest experience that they can uh, to the best of the ability that they have and want. Awesome. All right. So my role in the college is to do pre-major advising. So for students who aren't necessarily sure of which one of our eight majors they're looking to, um, I can help 
describe what all of our different opportunities are. But when you really want to, want to get into the specifics of what does it look like to complete a major, what are the different opportunities in each major, our academic advisors are the go-to folks. So you can um, type in a question, you can address it to one of our panelists, or you can keep it general and we can find someone to answer for you. But what do you guys want to know about? While we're letting some people uh, write their questions in, I just wanted to address one of the questions that was answered uh, in text by Mikkel, but it had to do with what you need to do and when you can start and when you can apply to any of these majors. So um, kind of like Mikkel typed in uh, in the chat, they are open majors. So what that means is there's no separate application for the majors in aquatic fishery sciences, marine biology, or oceanography. What you in fact do is you uh, set up your general application for admission to the whole University of Washington. Uh, as part of that application, they'll ask you what your first choice major is. Uh, and if you put any one of those three majors and you're admitted and you select UW, and it's the right fit for you, uh, you go right into that program. Um, so it would be uh, Samantha, it would be me, it would be Michelle Townsend as your individual advisors. So right now the three of us are working with new freshmen who are coming in this fall. Um, and uh, if that's what you want to do and you stick with our program, that's great. Uh, and uh, we'll be your advisors the whole time there. Um, just as a quick note, uh, that works both for people who are really sure this is what they want to do. And it also works for people who are just exploring the area, it's totally okay to be in the major right from the start, even if you're not sure 100% that it's what you wanna earn your whole degree in. You can actually change, you have the freedom to change. So you're admitted to UW for all the different major options there. And just by choosing a major that's open that you start with doesn't mean that you are fixed with it for all four years. And that, to follow that up too, um, the marine bio, oceanography, and aquatic and fishery sciences have pretty similar preparatory coursework. Um, so a student can come to the UW thinking they want to be um, in aquatic and fishery sciences and then think, oh, you know what, actually oceanography is really what I want to be. But the, because that basic coursework, that biology, chemistry, physics, calculus is all pretty standard, it's not standard, but pretty similar. Um, it's not that hard to actually switch majors um, or add majors, uh, you know, even into the second year. Um, one of the things I, I think is really key to remember is to just sort of be in touch with your academic advisor. We're all, as Mikkel pointed out, we have small programs and each program has its own professional advisor. So we're all very available and pretty easy to get to via email or Zoom these days. So, um, you know, I'm meeting with a couple of new freshmen now who aren't sure what they want to major in, we're talking about it in a broad, in a broad way. So that's what we're here to help you do. So definitely stay in touch with us. I don't know, the students might have some feedback on that. Um, uh, and hopefully, I know Reagan um, took advantage of, of my services a lot. I can't speak for the other students, but um, really, you know, that's what we're here for. And on that note, so Sam and Joe, there's a question about, so how do you, among those three majors, right? Aquatic sciences, marine biology, oceanography, how did, what are, what's different about them? How do you distinguish them? Um, I'll start, Joe, jump in, correct me. Um, and if Mikkel is still listening, she can certainly talk a little bit more about oceanography in, in Michelle's absence. Um, uh, Michelle Townsend's absence. Um, so there, there's a lot of overlap. Um, generally, in aquatic and fishery sciences, we um, look at all life in water, and we're not really focusing just on the marine environment. We're also looking at a lot of freshwater environments, and because of where we're positioned in the Northwest, there's a, you know, the, there's a lot of overlap between the freshwater and marine environments, and, and there's a lot of organisms that live in both. So we're really looking at the life in water. Um, we look at it from a pretty broad perspective. So, you know, certainly biology and biodiversity is key, but we're also looking at conservation and, and management, um, you know, fisheries, um, some, some husbandry, um, we're looking at ecology, uh, we're looking at, we even have some economic um, sort of uh, investigations and a lot of quantitative stuff. So a lot of our faculty do quantitative work in data analysis and modeling. Um, and our major works really well hand in hand with the quantitative sciences minor, which is um, just a fancy way of saying statistics uh, around natural sciences. Um, so uh, that will, that's kind of what aquatic and fishery science is about. Um, we, are, um, we also focus quite a bit on um, 
scientific methodology research, um, scientific inquiry. There's a lot of research being done in the program from our faculty, but also uh, we really encourage our students to be involved as much as possible with hands-on stuff. And we require a capstone project, which is a an intensive, it's a fancy way of saying senior research, senior thesis, but it's pretty intensive. Um, so I'll hand that off to Joe and he can talk a little bit about marine biology. Yeah, ab absolutely. Thanks, Sam. And I, I'm going to actually skip and speak a little bit out of turn um, just because it's on the other side of things and it'll make sense when I talk about marine bio there, um, which is to go to oceanography. So when you study oceanography, you're just studying the marine environment, but um, you are also studying the kind of physical processes of the marine environment. So you can just as much be studying geology, physics, chemistry, you know, some of these processes, uh, processes that Mikkel were kind of uh, was kind of introducing um, just as much as you're studying the biology you know uh, biological oceanography um, and the reason that I go with that um, there is because marine biology is um, as a program kind of located in between aquatic and fishery sciences and oceanography um, so we're actually uh, kind of a hybrid program where actually your professors, we're not a separate department in the, in the same you know, way that you have a bunch of marine biology professors. Um, the faculty are primarily going to be made up of faculty from the School of Aquatic Fishery Sciences, School of Oceanography, and some of the biology um, department faculty as well. Um, and so as a marine biology major, you're going to be taking a lot of courses um, in certain areas that are going to overlap with the marine side of fisheries. And you're also going to take a lot of courses that are going to overlap primarily with the biological side of oceanography, um, but maybe a little bit of the chemical and physical just definitely not as much as you would do full on um, in uh, full on in the oceanography major. So um, Sam already kind of led into this talking about the aquatic and fishery sciences capstone, but um, that's something that I just want to kind of emphasize, which is that um, the majors can have a lot of overlapping content, but some of the experiences, especially at the senior project kind of final project can actually be really distinguishing features so you can figure out which one works best for you. So Sam already talked about the capstone. Um, I should let the oceanography reps here talk about the senior research um, thesis and senior research crews. Um, for marine biology, we actually require students to go to Friday Harbor Labs uh, and spend a certain amount of time from three to five or even a full 10 weeks at Friday Harbor Labs um, doing advanced undergraduate research. But it is um, different. It's a different amount of time um, than the full year-long aquatic fishery sciences capstone and definitely different from oceanography as well. Um, so maybe really, oh. really quick before we move on. Um, I also want to add to what Joe said. We do have these very distinct sort of required experiences in our majors, but not, none of that actually excludes students from taking advantage of all of them. Um, we don't require the field experience, but a lot of our students do go to Friday Harbor Labs and really enjoy their time there. And I also know that a lot of marine biology students would will come in and do all kinds of uh, research. And it certainly is not an impossibility to double major if you really respond to being required to do things to get them done, you can double major and then you have to do both of them. Um, but it's, uh, we're really, we work fairly collaboratively as majors. It's not about, uh, you can only do research in ours and you can only do field work in this one. Actually, there's, there's not that sort of um, separation of, of experiences, so. Yeah, that's a All great right. point. Yeah. I'm gonna bring in our students here, so. Since we have a fishery student, an oceanography student, and a marine biology student, you guys are perfect to kind of talk about this subject. But I also want you to wrap in. So Sylvia wants to know what made you pick UW. So if you can just take a couple minutes each and talk about how you picked UW, but then also how you picked your major, that would be great. I will go first uh, because I really owe it to um, both Joe and Sam, who are here right now. It's really why I'm here. Um, I was a little high school senior, like, okay, I think I want to study the ocean. What do, what's next? Um, and between the colleges I was looking at, Joe and Sam were the ones who were like, come into our offices, sit down. We want to talk to you about all your options. Um, and so 
with that, I was kind of like, I, at the time, we did not have the marine biology major. I thought that that was kind of where I was headed. Um, but uh, between oceanography and fisheries, I was like, okay, fisheries sounds like I like animals. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, and it really surprised me, honestly, with um, with the depth of understanding that I now have about a variety of different topics that I thought I wasn't going to study, um, like economic standpoints, um, thinking about fisheries as a resource and how do we use this resource in a sustainable way um, is a really good experience. So I highly recommend fisheries for sure. Hi, I can go next. Um, so a lot of people ask me this question because I'm from Hawaii and the University of Hawaii has a great marine biology program. But the reason why I chose UW is because of the abundance of resources available. Um, I really like the idea of attending a large university and then making it smaller and finding your place. Um, the college and the environment certainly has allowed me to do so. Um, when I applied, the marine biology program wasn't available, so I applied as aquatics and fishery sciences. And then when it did open, as I was a freshman, I switched over to there and that process was super easy. Um, so yeah, that's how I got the marine biology major. Yeah, so I'm actually a transfer student. Um, so I came into UW like knowing I wanted to do oceanography um, and I chose it because I knew that there were a lot of opportunities and like research opportunities um, and also um, just opportunities outside of oceanography. So like I said, I'm also majoring in dance, which is kind of a weird combination, but I've been able to do that just because um, it, it worked with my schedule and it's really nice because I get to do like something really science focused and something really arts focused. Um, so yeah, I kind of went into it knowing I was going to do oceanography, but found other opportunities along the way. Great. And then if the three of you also want to talk about, there's a good question here. Perfect for you. How much do you, how much time do you have outside of coursework and classes? Talk about that a little bit. I guess I can <laughs> work on that. Um, so I do work in a lab and then I also have an internship. So apparently I have enough time in my schedule for those things. Um, but I'd say um, at least the oceanography major from experience is pretty flexible as well. So um, you can take the classes that you're really interested in. And I think that allows you to have, you know, more time outside of coursework because you're not just like pushing through something that you don't want to do or like having to take all these classes that you're just not that interested in. So I think that definitely makes it possible to have more time outside of coursework and classes. Um, it's kind of up to how you do your schedule. All right. Anything to add, Reagan or Ina, on that one? All right. And then let's see who wants to talk about how hard it is to double major. I don't know if one of our advisors wants to take that or are any of you doing a double major, students? Oh, Jordan. Tell us about it, Jordan. And then we can have one of the advisors chime in too. Um, yeah, I, it is a little weird for me because I'm doing them in two different colleges. Um, so College of the Environment and College of Arts and Sciences. So that makes it a little complicated in terms of requirements, but I think it's possible. And if you're really interested in two things, um, I think it's definitely an option. If you just talk to your advisor, um, they'll definitely make it work. Um, like both my advisors that I have for my majors are really understanding about requirements and making it all work out. Awesome, thanks. And you had said oh. you were doing dance, sorry. I somehow didn't remember that, Sam. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll kind of add about that. Um, what I was talking about a little bit earlier about the similarity between the, the preparatory coursework, actually for students who are interested in more sort of related majors, so maybe not dance and oceanography, um, but certainly, you know, marine bio and fisheries or marine bio and oceanography or oceanography and fisheries, there's the, the base coursework is really similar. And so getting that out of the way means that there's lots of time to sort of um, plan for those extra courses in the other majors. Um, it's, it's more work. It's not, it's not going to be like easy. It's not like you don't have to do anything extra, but it's not, 
it's not a difficult thing. And, and again, I'll go back to that meet with your advisor because we're definitely there to help plan around, okay, here are the courses that you have, here are the courses you need, what is your timeline, what do you want to accomplish? And we can help kind of um, um, help students create that timeline and see what will fit within that. Um, you know, for students who are kind of hitting the ground running with the major, with one of these natural sciences majors, um, really it's actually not hard because you're already doing what you need to do. You've, you've, you're not like taking a lot of classes that you may not need because you're, so that's kind of an, an advantage to, to especially meeting uh, with advisors early. So the short answer is it's not difficult if you're willing to put in a little bit of the extra work, um, knowing that, you know, because again, you know, one major might have a capstone requirement, the other has a field requirement. That's timing that you have to work around. Um, plus, you know, if you want to study abroad or if you want to do a minor or if you want to do an internship, it's just, it's just time management. Um, and really, uh, and I don't know, Joe, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, that, those are all great points. Um, I just have one small thing to add, which is that um, if you are attending something like this, uh, right now, you're ahead of the game thinking about your majors and thinking about your planning for it. Um, so even though, um, yes, double majoring takes additional time, um, you can find that if you're working earlier on with the majors that you're interested in, it can be a little bit more efficient. So it might not necessarily mean like a full extra year. Um, remember that a lot of our majors are structured in such a way that well, we have some people starting with our majors, even, you know, they had no idea what they were going to do the first year and they still graduate in four years just fine. So if you're starting early on and you're getting in touch with us early on, that can really help um, as well. So, you, you know, you're taking step one by doing this today. All right. And then Ina and Joe, there's a question about what's an example of a marine biology capstone. So I, I, Maybe just to clarify, because it can be really confusing, um, and I'd like to hear um, Reagan anyway talk about it. So, uh, so we uh, have these different titles for different things, um, and so aquatic and fishery sciences is the one that has um, something that's actually called a capstone. Um, for marine biology, it's called uh, this integrative field experience is the name, um, but. Um, even if you were like, yeah, I wanted to hear about the integrative field experience, we can get to that uh, in a second. And, um, but Reagan, are you able to tell us a little bit about your capstone? Oh boy, how much time do you have? Um, so for capstone, specifically for fisheries, it's a three quarter um, experience, let's say. Um, so your first quarter, you're basically kind of doing all the planning um, and kind of prepping the experiment. Uh, you're working with usually one faculty member that you've gotten in contact with said, hey, let's do it. Like sometimes they advertise, hey, I have this project I want an undergrad to hop on. Or sometimes you're, you're a go-getter and you're like, hey, I like what you're doing. I want to do that for a capstone. Um, so but yeah, basically your first quarter is kind of uh, planning, uh, doing your proposal for the experiment. Your second quarter is really getting meaty with it and doing the experiment, doing all the hard work, all the field work, um, getting some to start on your data analysis if, you've, if you're really on it. Um, and then your uh, last quarter is spent doing your data analysis, uh, doing your write-up of your paper, and then doing a uh, presentation. So um, everyone who does a capstone, we have a symposium so they can um, have an opportunity to, pre to present their work. So that's, that's Capstone in a nutshell. I also, um, I pasted a link to um, a list of our past Capstones in, in Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. Now it's only titles, we don't have content, um, but it, it may be of interest for, for students who just wanna see what the breadth of work that's being done in Aquatic and Fishery Sciences is. And Oceanography may have, um, Jordan may know if Oceanography has a similar resource um, where it's just, uh, there's a lot of really cool things being done. And I don't know, Reagan, if you even mentioned your subject, what you were doing, but um, anyway. So for example, just look in the, the q and I pasted the link. All right. And then there's a question about that got upvoted actually. So what's the difference between the biology department and the College of the Environment? And I'm actually going to answer that because I majored in the biology department and I used to be an advisor over there. But that was before 
ecology and environment was a thing and before marine biology was a thing. So the biology department at UW is in the College of Arts and Sciences, which is really big. The biology major is really big as well. They have, I think, almost as many students as we have in our whole college. They have some really great programs focused on ecology and conservation, um, but it is sort of a kind of a more uh, cellular, molecular kind of thing. They, they do look at plants and animals, but I would say that our majors are sort of more, um, just more focused. And again, that environmental aspect is a big part of it. Um, the challenge I think for some students, and you guys can talk about this maybe if you thought about doing biology, but when you're in the biology department, you're, all, you're surrounded with students who wanna do everything from med school to I don't know, genetics or whatever. So it's, it's a really broad swath of students, a lot of whom want to go on to, to pre-med and all that. So depending on that whole thing about finding your peeps, right? I think oftentimes the college and environment can be a better fit if you're interested in the specific topics that we have. Does anyone want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'll just quickly chime in because like I said, marine biology as a program draws in courses from a bunch of different departments. So primarily oceanography, aquatic fishery sciences and Friday Harbor Labs. But we do work a little bit with, um, with the biology department. But just to give you a sense of the scale of it, if we look at the courses that are in marine biology that are only offered by um, by the biology department, there's about three courses. So they can all be part of the marine biology major. Um, so it's just that the scope of what they're covering in the biology department is uh, maybe much, much broader than the kind of more focused area that we have. So they have some fa uh, fabulous marine ecologists, fabulous marine biologists that are faculty in the biology department, but it's maybe not enough to like say make a whole major out of. All right, and then how about, we have a question here about environmental policy. Talk about those courses and how they fit into some of these majors. And I'm gonna open that up to whoever wants to answer that. We don't, so SAFS doesn't have, I don't think any of our department have anything specifically on environmental policy per se, but um, there is a program, there's two programs within the College of Environment that's, uh, the School of Marine and uh, Environmental Affairs and the Program on the Environment or Environmental Studies that offer courses along those lines. Um, so for students with interests in policy, it, it's easy enough to find courses that can kind of enhance the, the study that they're doing in any of these um, aquatic majors uh, or the marine majors. Um, we do have in, in, in SAS, we do have one upper level course that's on econom economics, which doesn't quite it kind of strays into a policy area, but it's not quite the same thing. Um, I know that there's also a lot of curricular kind of, there's a lot of work being done on curriculum, um, especially to sort of increase uh, uh, the inclusiveness and in, uh, of the curriculum around uh, diversity and equity and inclusion. So we may see more coursework being developed that sort of strays a little bit more into policy or social um, dimensions of uh, you know, fisheries, oceanography, and marine bio. So it's, it's, there's potential that it, we may see more of that coursework. I just wanted to add, I'm in global environmental politics right now um, from the program of the environment. Um, and it's a really great class. Um, and I'm using it towards my general education requirements. So you could definitely um, stick some of those classes that are maybe not quite in your major, but that you want to take. You could put those towards your general education requirements. Great, okay. I'm gonna do two things here. Thanks for sticking with us. So I'm gonna first throw up a poll for, to ask for your feedback on this session before you take off. And then I'm also gonna go back to, there's some of our, there was a question that was answered um, that I just wanted to pick up a little bit. So. There was a question about job opportunities and helping students find jobs. So Jenna, who is Jenna and Gregory, who are behind the scenes, they made all this magic happen, by the way. That cute little uh, SpongeBob intermission thing, that was all Gregory. Jenna is doing all the screen share. They're awesome. They're our student assistants, and they are majors in the college as well. 
and they post on our um, career opportunities page. So Jenna provided that link for you in, um, in the Q&A. But are there other things, Sam or Joe, that you want to talk about for career, helping students find jobs and careers? Yes. <laughs> um, oh. Um, and Joe, uh, you'll probably, you, you actually have done a little bit more work in this than I have, so I should probably tell you talk, but we actually, before this lovely pandemic of ours, Joe and Michelle and I were actually working really closely with, um, Dan Tanis in um, in NOAA to develop, um, what were we calling that? Career networking, um, we were trying, so we were basically working with Dan and he was working with NOAA scientists and then we were enlisting students with interest where we paired them together to do informational interviews and just talk about what does a day in the life of a NOAA scientist look. And so that was a, a program that we actually were just getting ready to start and it got put on hold. I suspect once we get back to more normal um, kind of day-to-day -day operations, we can easily, uh, you know, revive that. So that's one thing, but it's also sort of Broader than that, Joe and Michelle and I have worked in the past and will continue to work in the future on um, uh, just initiatives around career um, and professional development for undergrads. Um, so I, I, I don't know what that is for right now, but I can give an example of things like maybe having, you know, resume workshops or cover, you know, cover later workshops, having panels where we bring in um, alumni who are gone on to, to do work. Um, and talking about that and how they got there and, and more like that. So that's definitely something that we're really um, excited about and is very important to sort of enhance the services that we have for students. Yeah, um, Sam, you're reminding me that we didn't come up with a clever like marine metaphor name for the program, but it was basically to connect students for career exploration with NOAA professionals. And the important part is that um, all of these like world class faculty that we have, the presence of the UW, it expands beyond campus for certain with the research that they're doing, but also with connections with large agencies like NOAA, of which we are very fortunate in the Seattle area to have a lot of like kind of research labs and campuses and facilities that are located, if not walking distance for at least one of them, a very short bike ride slash bus ride away from us. And so an example of how that translates out to you is, um, and actually now Sam is probably the best person to talk about this, but um, like before the pandemic, we were all completely set up where SAFs and marine biology were helping to co-fund and support internships with the Alaska Fisheries Science Center's Marine Mammal Lab, um, which actually the office is located in Seattle, even if it's focused on the Alaska region. So that was an, a way in which you could get summer internships. They were competitive. Um, but there were summer internships working on a high interest topic, marine mammals. There were a range of projects you could work with. Some of them were, you know, in Seattle. Some of them were way further afield. Um, and so that's the kind of thing, though, that you'll see pop up frequently. Sometimes it's more formalized through something like this, like a paid internship. A lot of other times it's because your faculty have these connections there. And so it's like I see all the time Michelle Townsend, Sam, sending out to job lists, you know, things like internships, volunteer opportunities, actual jobs that you can get. Um, oceanography and School of Aquatic Fishery Sciences have been around for a long time and they have deep, deep networks um, connected with potential employers. Really quick, I just want to say that NOAA, for, in case you don't know, because that's a, an acronym we throw around a lot, NOAA stands for National um, Atmospheric and Ocean National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and it's a government agency that does a lot of science around the ocean and atmosphere. So, and, and fisheries, which is not in part of the title, but they have tons of fisheries stuff. So um, just, just in case people didn't know what that was. Thanks, Dan. All right, and then Reagan, we have a question for you. What are you doing now that you've graduated? Oh boy, I'm hoping a job will land in my lap tomorrow. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, pandemic didn't really help the post-graduation plans i'm still kind of like looking at my watch like oh well when's summer break gonna end when am i going back to school so so we're still kind of dealing with that just moving out of the dorm doing all of that stuff um becoming real people you know um so for now i'm working at the seattle aquarium um i'm still doing my job there in the gift store watching for opportunities that might open up um really interested in maybe doing some of the education department stuff so i'm kind of on the lookout for that 
Um, I am tuned in to the um, SAFS jobs email list. Um, so all of these lovely emails that I always got from Sam and still am looking forward to every day um, to see kind of what opportunities are still there. So even though I've graduated, I'm still on that email list, getting those opportunities in my inbox. Um, just keeping my eyes peeled and seeing what's, what's coming up for me next. Awesome. Yeah, it's a tough time <laughs> for a lot of different reasons. Thanks, Reagan. Um, all right, so we have just a couple minutes. No more questions outstanding, but this is your last call for questions. So if you have anything last minute to add, um, last chance. All right, so then I shall say thank you for joining us today. Remember, we have three more sessions coming up later this month and in early September. Um, you can reach out with additional questions. Oh, good. See, Jenna's doing the magic again. So there's the next, um, the next sessions that we have coming up, environmental studies, ecology and conservation, and then the earth sciences one. And you're welcome to join us for all of those. Um, if you want to stay connected with us on our website, there is an option to sign up for a listserv that I manage and I just send out opportunities directly from the College of the Environment. You can follow us on social media. There was actually a great story that I was trying to find really quick and I couldn't about how College of the Environment is still doing our field stuff this summer. There's a great story that showed up on social media. Um, so that's a good way to follow us and keep up on things. If you have any questions, just email me directly. And then our advisors who you've met, Joe and Sam, and all the other advisors, they are very willing to um, meet with you. You can email them. If you need help finding email addresses for them, just give me a shout and I can introduce you to them. But we are all here for you. And thanks very much to our student panelists for joining us and to our advisors. And thank you all for joining us. And we hope we see you again soon. All right, take care.